Right. Hey, good morning. You guys are hardcore in this room right here. Four inches of snow, that's stupid, right? Like, come on. But anyway, you guys made it the frozen chosen for sure. Nothing on you. Um, those of you watching online, it's all right. We, we still like you. And we're glad you, you took a minute to check in with us today. Um, but if the power goes out again, you're out of luck. So anyway... Man, we're in week five of this sermon series. It's in the middle. Um, as we're talking about this series, again, just recap, when I talk about the middle, I'm talking about that difficult place in life. Usually it's process or uh, transition or development. It's the place no one really likes. We always want to get to the destination. We're not too hype on sticking in the place of development because development is hard and it takes work. And uh, unfortunately... Most of us, if we're going to do anything great and significant in our life, we'll spend most of our life in development, right? Because he who begun a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. means he's going to keep working on you to perfect what he started in you. And so, so my encouragement for anybody listening, watching, whatever, is get comfortable in the middle because you're going to be spending a lot of time there. If you're going to do what God's called you to do, you're going to need to learn how to, how to enjoy the middle. What's hard about the middle is you're not where you once were. You're not where you started, but you're also not where you see yourself going. You're, you're in this middle place, and sometimes that's difficult. It can feel hard. But like I've said throughout this whole series, God is so much more concerned with your development than he is just your destination. We think God wants to take me from point A to point B. He doesn't tell you that there's going to be C, D, Z, 4, 3. Like, he doesn't tell you that the path to get there isn't going to be as linear as you hope it would be. And sometimes in those moments, we can get frustrated and we can often lose heart and get disappointed. And so the purpose of my message, this whole series, is to encourage you, don't give up because it's worth it, because you have no idea what God is doing right now in your middle. You don't know what he's developing, you don't know what he's building, and you don't know what's going to come on the other side of you being faithful in this place. I'm calling this sermon, Marking Milestones in the Middle. In this series, we've been talking about Joshua. Now, here's the irony of today's message. Um, uh, Pastor Autumn preached this, the last, this, this text that I'm going to share with you today. She preached this text the last Sunday of December as we were getting ready to go into 2021, which was going to be the magic year where everything from 2020 was going to magically disappear and our worlds were going to be so much better. How many? It's just so much better right now that you flip the calendar one page. Exactly, right? So, but here's what's up. Like, too often, we get that mindset, right? I just need to get out this year and get into the next. Once I'm out of that, and everything's going to change. Some of you think that about relationship. If I just get out of that relationship, if I get rid of them, and I get with them, everything's going to be so much better. Here's the issue. Like, nothing changed. You're, you're still going in that place. It's still you in the equation. You understand what I'm talking about? Same thing with this year. It's not like as soon as we flip the calendar, everything was magically going to be a whole lot different. Coronavirus was going to go away. Churches were going to be full to the brim again. Like, it's, and, and here's the part that we got to be so careful with, and Autumn kind of pointed this out in her message. What if, don't, what if we miss what God's trying to do because we're so focused on getting out of our situation when he's like, I want you to kind of settle into this so I can teach you, instruct you, and guide you because if 2020 did anything, it caused all of us to pay attention, right? Life was normal. Everything was going the way we thought it would, and then of all of a sudden, pay attention. Our eyes got woke up. Many of you had lost so much during that year. It caused you to pay attention more than you ever have before. And so, so my thing is this. Let's not just move past it and miss the purpose of it. I don't want to do time for time's sake. 
If I'm in a season or a situation, I want to be in that season and get what I'm supposed to get from it. Because if I don't, I know God enough that he'll take me around the mountain again. He doesn't let me move into the next place until I get what he wants me to get here. Because he knows what he's developing and putting in me right now is what's going to sustain me when I get there. And like a good father, he loves me enough not to let me move too quickly because that'll kill me if I can't stand underneath it. So we're talking about this middle and, and, and we're talking about uh, Joshua 4 where, where the milestone, the markers. And I love it being about Joshua. And this is the cool part was Autumn and I talked about her message and I was listening to what she was talking about. I, it was there that I got inspired to like, I should just do an entire series on the book of Joshua because there's so much relevance to what he was going through to where I think we are as a society and as a people today. And so, so as we look at Joshua, he himself is in the middle of a journey. He's in this season where he transitioned, where he wasn't the leader. He was following Moses, faithfully following Moses. And then God says, Moses' time is done, and now it's your time to lead, Joshua. And not only are you going to lead, but you're actually going to lead them to the promise that I promised back to Moses. You're going to be the guy. Again, man, that can be a difficult situation. You're picking up a heavy mantle. I mean, Moses was the man. Joshua had no idea he would take hold of that and lead on, but God said, I'm choosing you. And so last week we talked about it sometimes in the middle where, where Joshua came up to the water, the Jordan, they camped there. And God said, in three days you're coming across this water. And Joshua said, okay. And when, as we kind of went through the story last week that God did what he said he would do, he stopped the water from flooding, which was completely impossible that only God could do. And they took a step of faith, and as they stepped out, God stopped the water, and they were able to cross over on dry land. In the middle, sometimes it's easy to feel like it's a never-ending struggle and a never-ending process. Have you ever had moments in your life when you're like, when is this all going to be over? I mean, please. Right? Okay, do I have to keep doing this over and over again? And it's often in these moments in the middle that we're going to be needed to be reminded of what God has done. Because here, listen to me, y'all. Like, just because you're in the middle doesn't mean there isn't still miracles. Doesn't mean you still can't see God. But I'm a firm believer that you find whatever you look for. Right? If all you're looking for is how bad it is right now, you will find it. And if all you're looking for is what God is about to do, you will find that too. And I think that's the reason why God does what he does in this story. Now, when I say a milestone, I want to give you the definition. I'm using kind of a business definition for like a project management. A milestone is a marker in a project that signifies a change or stage in development. That's very much needed in the development process. Especially if you're going to spend most of your life in the middle, you're going to have to have moments where you can look and see significantly something has changed. I've grown. Not the same. We've come through that. I saw God in that. And, and so this is what we're seeing happening before our eyes. Now, here's the difficult idea. Is, so these children of Israel, right, they just come across the Jordan, which stopped, which is very significant to when they came out of Egypt and the Red Sea parted. And the people that walked through, only two ever walked through the Red Sea. The rest of them have never experienced. They heard the stories, but they've never seen anything like this in their life. So they, they see this miracle that brings them in. And you've got to think in their mind they were excited. God said he would do it, and look what he just did. It's time to go into the promised land. See, right now, these guys, they have this thing called momentum. That's a powerful word, momentum. It's a thing that everybody tries to get in sports, right? When you get momentum, it just seems like everything starts working. I, I won't put a Packer joke in there. They ju it just keeps working, right? It just, you've got the, you're moving forward. It's like once you've got momentum, everything seems to be falling into place. It's a powerful word when it comes to business. Companies will struggle to get started and get started, and then all of a sudden, they'll start to get momentum, 
And that's where the power of, of what you've done and the hard work seems to be propelling you forward. Like it's all, you don't have to put as much effort. I remember a b- business book I read a long time ago um, called Good to Great by Jim Collins. If any of you have ever read it, great book. But anyway, he talked in there about the flywheel principle. The purpose of a flywheel is simply this. You get enough energy going that once you, it's hard to get that thing going, but once it starts going, it doesn't take as much energy because what comes back, the, the propulsion of it kind of moves it forward. And that's momentum. And that's what these guys have right now. So logically, get your swords. Get your spears. Let's go take Jericho. We just came through a miracle. We just talked through dry land. It is time to go and conquer. It is time to go get what's ours. And that's not what God does. That's not how God moves them from this point. He brings them across, but then he stops them. So here's the question I have today. Why? Why would he slow them down? Why, when they're at the top of the top, their faith couldn't be stronger right now. They just walked through dry ground. Not only is their faith great, remember I talked about last week that when the water stopped, it was stopped a great distance away, like 18 miles, in eyesight of Jericho, the major city that had to fall if they were going to take this promised land. Like the enemy is freaking out. Their faith is at the very top. Let's go. So why would God do it different? Why would he slow it down? Why would he not allow them to move so quickly? And what... Out of this, can we learn for our lives? How can we apply some of these truths that we're going to glean from Joshua today in our own world, especially those of you who are in the midst of your own middle? Turn with me to Joshua chapter 4, verses 1 and 3. It says, when the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up the 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan from right where the priests are standing and carry them over with you and put them down at a place where you stay tonight. You just come through and the priests are still standing. They're still, they're still excited. They're, 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 they're right there. And God says, go back and get me some stones and collect them and bring them over. We're going to use these. Go back. We just got through. Why would I go back to a place that I just came from? I mean, come on, God. Faith is forward. There's no armor on the backside when it comes to God's armor. If you turn your back, you're going to get shot. Right? Anybody ever heard that preaching before? No? Yeah. Every time it's like, only the armor of God. Did you put the armor of God on today? People would ask me that. Like, Chris, did you put the armor of God on today? I'm like, no. Why not, brother? Because I didn't take it off last night. Like, <laughs> helmet of salvation, that's a lock, right? Breastplate of righteousness, that's what he does for me, not me. You understand what I'm talking about? Like, no, I didn't put the arm of God, I didn't take it off. Well, if you turn around, brother, like, sometimes we got to get our minds a little bit different. God says, go back and get some stones and bring them to the other side, and you're going to put them where I want you. Again, development, not just destination. I'm sure at this moment, these children of Israel are like, Josh, come on, man, let's go. We're ready. Them Jericho, we're taking them down. Come on, brother, let's get them. And Joshua's like, that's not what God says. Go back, get some stones. What? Wait, we're supposed to take Jericho, and now you want us to carry rocks? That doesn't make any sense, man. Why would you, why would you ask me to do that? Right? I mean, it's like, it's like these guys are pumped. They're like, come on, somehow we made it. I knew we would, right? If you don't know what that is, it's all right, don't. Um, but how about us? We get to the other side of our situation. Our feet feel like they hit the promised land, and we're good. And we're ready to sit back and drink uh, drinks with little umbrellas in it and just uh, nothing, like just chill. I mean, these guys have been wondering for 40 years, 40 years, believing that one day they would step foot into the promised land. And when Jericho parted, they actually stepped foot into the promise. It's time. It's exciting. We've made it. Yes. And yet, what's life going to be like in the promised land? 
What's it like when you step into your dream? What's it like when you get that job promotion? What's it like when you finally got married? I mean, you've been dreaming of that moment for your whole life, and now it's just going to be bliss because you're married. Everything's going to be one. I mean, you love them so much. How could you ever fight with them or be angry with them? I mean, you know, for all good Christian boys, it's like, I can't wait to get married. I can have sex anytime I want. It's going to be amazing. (laughs) What's it like when you all step into your dream? What happens? What's it like now that you're finally sober? No umbrella drinks for you, but it's, it's going to be amazing. For the children of Israel like us, when we go into the promise, it was an eternal vacation. In fact, the, ram, the truth was, in the promise, the problems got bigger. You know why they gave you the promotion, right? So they could give you the bigger problems to deal with. More money means more problems. You understand what I'm talking about? They don't promote you so you can just enjoy life a little bit more. They promote you because they think you can handle more problems. The higher you go up, the more problems they give you, right? Some of you are like, I can't wait to get the promotion. Then you get it, and you're like, what is this? That's what you asked for. Oh, marriage. Right. It's fun. It's good. But it's going to require a lot more work because you will never know how selfish you really are till you get married. You think you're good. You think you're loving God and loving everybody else. Get married then. See how much you love everybody. Like, because it's 24 7 then, right? You come to church and pretend and be like, oh, praise the Lord. Everything's so wonderful. Wake up like that. Nope. It increases. I'm not saying more marriage, more problems. No, I won't say that. I'm smarter than that. But what I am saying is, as, as you step into these promises that God has for you, it's not just bliss. There's going to be continual struggle. There's going to be times where it's going to feel like this isn't a blessing. And that's for the children of Israel. That's why I'm going to caution you. Because sometimes you'll look at other people's blessing and you envy their blessing. Don't envy my blessing. Because you don't know the problems that come with my blessing. It's easy to look from the outside and go, oh, that looks like the greatest life ever. Step into it for a minute. See, because the the reality is this, what I'm stepping into, God's called me to, but it's not going to just be a blip. Heaven is vacation. Heaven is bliss. Heaven is when the struggle stops. I can't wait for heaven, but on this earth, I'm always going to struggle. That's what Jesus said. That's what's happening with you in your middle is you're going to consistently struggle. So now their trust and dependence for God has to go even deeper. It's kind of like when you build a skyscraper. Do you understand? The higher you go up, the deeper the footings have to go. Because if you don't go deep, you're going to go high and it's going to come crashing down. And so that's what God is trying to get them to understand. Yeah, you just came through a difficult situation. Yes, your feet are now on the promised land. But here's what I know. The Jordan you just crossed is nothing compared to the battle that's still ahead of you. So stop. You're not ready to go take them yet. Because I need to teach you how to mark the milestones in your journey. Because there's going to be moments in your journey where you're going to want to go back. There's going to be moments in your journey where you're going to look at the walls that are so great. That like I said, the Bible says chariots raced on them. And you're going to wonder, how is this ever going to happen? So God says, I'm going to teach you right now how to mark these milestones. So that when your faith starts to flutter. When you start to feel like, I'm not sure I'm going to get through this one. You can be reminded of what I've done the past, what I'm going to do now, and what I'll continue to do for you in your future. He's saying we need to learn to mark some milestones in our journey. And keep in mind, the middle is always foundational work. And if the foundation is not strong, the house won't stand. Some of us, we want the house to look good. We want everything on the outside to be right. But we're not willing to keep doing the work on the foundation, which is what will keep the house standing when the storm comes. You can make it as pretty as you want to. If your foundation is weak, that house is coming down eventually. It's the same with marriage, right? I, I, I've, I've had friends that, that, they, that on the outside, their marriage looked perfect. And they let nobody see any of the cracks. 
And eventually, the house came down. And people sitting around going, oh my gosh, I never saw that coming. The foundation was messed up. How'd you expect that to last? Yeah, they might look perfect, but it wasn't perfect. Nobody's perfect. We all got our issues. We all got our struggles. Are we willing to work on it? The problem with lying to yourself that everything is perfect, you start to believe it. You stop working. And that's what God's trying to say to these people right here. He's like, look, look, this is a good thing, but we ain't done. Jericho is in the distance. Here's, here's, a, here's a line I put. God knows before we can do something great, we must be something great. Greatness is built, not bred. You're not born great. I don't care what anybody says. Greatness is made. It's made in difficult times, in difficult circumstances. That's where people become great. You don't know somebody's great until you've watched them walk through something. That's where greatness starts to be formed. Greatness is built in the middle. In the middle, God wants to conquer the children of Israel's spirituality before he takes them to conquer cities, right? That's what God is trying to do in this moment. Some of you are like, Pastor, it feels like my life is on a treadmill, like I'm not making any progress. It might look like that, but the truth is you don't see often what's happening in the middle because it's foundational work. If you're watching a house be built, when they're working on the foundation, you don't see anything from a distance, but I promise you, the work they're doing right there will allow whatever they're building to stay the test of time. Some of us, that's the problem. We, we skip the foundation. We want to go straight to what people see. We got we to gotta be willing to do the hard work to get to where God is calling us to. You're not going to see it. You're not going to even feel at times that work's being done. But the success that will sustain success is the, how much you're willing to keep working in that place. If the foundation is strong, it's because y'all were willing to do the hard work in the middle, in the moment you're in right now. And so what I love uh, about, you know, we've got our journey group starting this week. And I'm not saying anybody else sign up because I don't think there's a place for anybody else sign up. Like y'all are full. I'm so glad so many people have signed up for it. That's incredible. You have to wait for the next time around. But what I love about journey is simply this. It's foundation. It's the, it, 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 and it literally, it's almost like you ever, ever have a house situation or know of a situation where the foundation cracked and you got to dig out and you got to get back down to the foundation to resecure it so the house doesn't come down. That's exactly what Journey does because it goes back into the story of your life, into your childhood and the different things that caused you to think and act and respond the way that you do. Some of y'all, you get all mad, like, Rrr. you don't understand why. It's the f cracked in foundation, man. That's what I love about this whole journey concept is you're going down, you're digging deep, you're building and you're fixing a foundation so it's going to last. God, we need more of that. Like that, that, that to me is so much more important than being here on a Sunday. Because you can come on a Sunday and shout and be like, woohoo, that was good. Oh, it made me feel good. And but when you start going down, you start working on the foundation of your life and you start solidifying the things that have been broken, you're going to start to see something build. And it ain't just about you because there's other people watching you in the midst of your middle. And that's what God is trying to do is. And, and I, I just love the idea that we can be a healthy church like that. That's willing to work on our real stuff, not the stuff that everybody sees. That's weak right now. That class ain't for weak people. It's hard. You ain't going to like it sometimes. Or at least me, because I, I don't like talking about feelings. But it was good. And I probably need more of it, but we're moving on. So Joshua, uh, chapter 4, verse 4. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord the God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of tribes of the Israelites to serve as a sign among you in the future. And when your children ask you what future or what do these stones mean, tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. Verse 6, in the future, tell the kids, this is what happens when we follow the presence of God. He does miracles. 
pay attention to what God's doing here. It ain't. See, see, this is the, the important thing you need to remember consistently, especially parents. In the middle, they're with you. And in the middle, they're watching. And they're watching how you respond. And you're teaching them whether you want to or not, because some things are taught, not just caught. Or excuse me, some things are caught, not just taught. You're teaching them who God really is and what you really believe. See, because you don't really know a man's heart or woman's heart, for that matter, until you see them respond to adversity. That's where real character is revealed. Now, when life is good, it's when life gets difficult, when you're in a middle process. And so what, what God is saying is, Joshua, tell the kids so that when they walk by, they see that God's presence, that impossible things become possible. Tell the kids to, that, that, to, that things can get hard, but, but wherever they go, they're never going to go alone because wherever they're at, God will be with them. He'll stay with them. The children of Israel, they stop and they celebrate the win. That's something that's hard in our society. How much do we celebrate, y'all? How many times once we overcome something or we conquer something or we meet a milestone, do we take time to stop and celebrate? We live in a culture that says more, more, forward, do more. That's my issue. I have a hard time. Here's how you know you got issues, right? You can't celebrate it. Like you overcome something, you come through something, you, you accomplish something, and you can't stop to celebrate the accomplishment. There's something in your mind going, what's next? Why? Because often I'm looking to fulfill something on the inside of me. It's more about me and my accomplishments than it's about accomplishing something. It makes me feel like better about myself. That's how you know it's an addiction, right? And I tell the church all the time, we're all addicted. I'm not talking just substance use. There's that addiction, but then there's work addiction. There's image addiction. We all have an addiction. Something I try to do to distract me from me, to make me feel better about me because who I am as I am is not enough. And, and, and so that's what we see here is God saying, stop, celebrate, take a moment, build a memorial so you can talk about it to your kids. So your kids know that it isn't just one thing to the next thing. But that you take a moment to begin to build the legacy of faith. Again, I say in our society, man, we're so bad at celebrating. We always want to take the hill, but we don't stop to celebrate once we've taken it. We just keep moving forward. God says, stop, party. They did some hard work. Don't need to keep climbing success. I've got your success. You just need to enjoy this moment right now. Ain't it funny that God stops them? How many know God to be the God that's always moving forward? The kingdom of God suffer violent and violent men lay hold of it. Come on, right? We ain't got time to sleep. We've got the Lord's work to do. That doesn't make sense with what he's saying here. Maybe that's more about the preacher feeling good about himself because he's so busy. I'm out there saving souls. I never stop. So you're in sin, right? Because remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy? Um-hmm. Uh and the Sabbath doesn't have to be a Sunday. It's just supposed to be 24 hour, 24 hour period of unproductivity. It's in the, that, that 10 list, right? Up there with adultery and murder. And in fact, it's, I think it's two, two or three. And I think if you read it, it's probably, there's more written about that than any other commandment. That's all right. You can skip that one, though, because God didn't really mean that. That was for another day in time, right? Just like murder and all that. Come on. And yet that's, that, that's the mindset in the world that we live in that just never slows down and it never stops. He says, talk about it to the kids. Again, man, I'm going to reiterate right now in your middle, your kids are with you. Your family is with you. And they're all watching. They're all listening. They're all observing. And you're teaching them whether you want to or not. So when things don't go right in the middle, how do you respond? How do you react? What's the first words that come out your mouth? Because whatever they are, that's what they're watching. That's what they're learning. And that's what they're coming to understand about God. So how, how are you teaching them? Mom and dad, what are you teaching? What are they catching? 
I'm sorry. There, there's no kid ministry right now. But real talk, you're the teacher. Kid ministry should be happening on a daily at your home. That's the one thing I like about the pandemic is we had to shut it down. But it, it, it gives you an understanding that that's not my job. Never has been our job. It's not the church's job to bring your kids to church and say, teach them faith, because I can't teach them what you undo the other six days. Hmm. Listen, the only reason I talk about the other six days so much, it was that part of my life, seeing some things that didn't seem to line up with what God said and what I was learning in church with what I saw outside of church that caused me to go, I'm not really sure there's a God. Because if he was real, it should be different. What I hear them talk about and what I see before me ain't the same. And that's no judgment on my family, whatever. We're all imperfect. We all got our struggles. We all got our issues. And I'm sure mom and dad are watching right now. But it's just real. And it's the thing I need you to hear from me. Like, is simply this. You're the teacher. There was a moment where a pastor thought it would be a good idea to make me a kid's pastor. Dumbest idea ever. Okay? I don't speak well when it comes to kids in regards to I say words that little kids are not allowed to say stupid and shut up and all those things right and so but but there was something that, that I began to understand as I worked with these little kids was simply this that they're much smarter than you think they are and they're picking up much more and whatever you lay down they'll pick up and you can develop them but here's the frustration I would have they would come to church and they would be up all night playing Grand Theft Auto like till midnight and they'd be dozing off in kids church and now I'm supposed to teach him about Jesus. I'm like, well, why aren't you helping my kid? Because you are messing him up. Real talk, I should be the echo in your kid's life. I shouldn't be the main voice. That's your job. You will be more important to your kid than any other person that ever lived. No pastor will be in your kid's life forever, but you will. Till the day you, you, you go to glory. And hopefully the legacy of faith you left behind. You're the teacher. And here's what's real, y'all. You can't take that little one where you haven't gone. You want to teach them faith? Get some. You want to teach them the good things and the mighty things of God? Believe. Step out. It's like it's time that we get back to that place. This is, the, this is to me, is the frustration. It's like, well, the world is so bad these days. Yeah, it's all happening on our watch. Look, I, again, I will reiterate, I give a, I could care less what's happening right now in the White House. What matters to me is what's happening in your house. Oh, they're trying to take faith away from us. Uh, they don't have to. You already took it out the home. When's the last time your kids caught you praying? When's the last time? And listen, this is, here's what I'm not saying, because this would always happen. Some preacher would preach a message like this and be like, kids, guess what? From now on, 6 o'clock every morning, we're doing devotions as a family. So get up. I hated those messages. <laughs> it was like, and, but here's what's real, y'all. It would last for all about a week. <laughs> and then we would be back to normal. So eventually you just didn't worry about it. No, 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 no. See, you, you, can, you can make it an event if you really want to. Here's what I'm trying to challenge you to do. Make it a lifestyle. Right? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The Shema, the one thing that a little boy would be taught, a little girl would be taught as, a, as an Israel, Israelite. From the moment, it was the first prayer. We John 3 16. No, no, no. Theirs was the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Teach these things to your children when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. What's it saying? Consistently, consistently teach them. When you're driving in the car, when you see God do something great, start to talk about God and what He does and what He can do and how He can bring you through. See, that's what He's trying to get across is teach them. Teach them what I'm trying to tell you. Like, I, this is, I've always had an issue in this area. I remember when I was a youth pastor, and there was a moment where, like, there was this big push. we got to get all our kids to go to Bible college, because if they don't go to Bible college, they're going to fall away and go to hell, because these secular professors are leading them astray. Right? And I'm always that guy in the room that goes, um, is it because they really don't know God anyway? Because all we do is entertain them in youth group, but we're not really changing anything? How dare you? 
Because for real, like, what are we doing? Like, once a week, that's going to fix them? Like, that's going to make everything better? Is it because we guilt them into not going to dances and not listening to this music and that music? Because that's not what good Christians do. So they make that choice because they like you and they want you to like them. But when they finally get out on their own and they, they've never been taught really how to make a choice, they've been told what to do and not to think about what they do, could it be because of that? Nah, that's crazy thoughts. Here's the, here's the truth, y'all. If we talk about our kids falling apart, here's my question. If the house is falling apart, do you blame the house or the builder? If we're watching things fall apart around us, you, do, do, do you put it on the house or do you put it on the builder? Now, Bible, no condemnation. I'm not here to condemn or put anybody down. I'm just here to reemphasize the importance of the foundation you're laying right now in the midst of your middle, especially all have little kids. My wife would tell me stories of when they were growing up, there would be moments when God would bring a breakthrough, right? Like he'd provide financially and they, they, it wasn't gonna happen. They, they just seemed bleak. She would tell me like from that point on, mom would make a special meal or a cake on that Memorial Day to remind them of what God did for them. We only celebrate any holiday they tell us to celebrate, Christmas, Easter, Halloween, whatever, right? What about those moments? What about those moments specific to your family? The day you saw God do something in your home and you made a moment, you marked the calendar and said, from this day forward, this day we're going to remind ourselves of what God did. That's a legacy of faith. That's when it becomes more about, oh, it was on Christmas that Jesus came to the earth and not for everyone. That's nice. But what about the moment when you didn't know how the bills were going to be paid, kind of freaking out, the lights were about to get shut off, and somehow a check showed up in your mailbox? Listen, your kids have no, no, would have no reason to be sad about throwing another party throughout the year, okay? Like to, 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 to have a special meal, to have a cake, something. Like start thinking about moments like that. Start marking the moments. Maybe you're in the midst of a battle with cancer. Mark the moment when, when, when God came through to remind yourself this is what God did. Mark the moments in the middle of your hard time right now where it feels like the world is crushing you when you finally felt like you got a breath. There's one thing I love about the recovery community is they do a great job marking moments. 60 days, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, one month, two months, three months, years. They just mark them, celebrate success. Here's a win. It would be good for us to start to adopt some of these mindsets to begin to mark these moments because here's what these moments do. It gives me a point of reference to look back to because there's going to be something else in front of me. There's going to be, I came through Jericho or I came through the Jordan, but there's still going to be a Jericho and there's going to be moments where I'm staring at Jericho and I'm going to feel fear and I'm going to feel like I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do this. But when I can quickly reference back to the moments that have been marked where God came through, it begins to be build my faith to say, ah, that's the, I came through that. I can go through that as well. That's why God's trying to slow him down and get him to learn how to mark some moments. And that's what God wants to do. Here, here's a thought I put when it comes to your kids, and I'll move on because it's a little bit of a soapbox and I've stayed to there. But it's simply this, daily teaching your kids to seek God's presence is greater than perfect church attendance. I'll, I'll say it one more time for online people might have missed. Daily teaching your kids to seek the presence of God is more important than perfect church attendance. Growing up, it was always like every Sunday we're going to be in church if we only had church every day of the week in the home. It might be different. You understand what I'm talking about? That's the kind of stuff that makes it. Devil's all right with you going to church. As long as you throw it all up before you walk out the door. You get in the fight on your way home so everything is a void. What he doesn't like is when your home becomes church. And when the presence of God becomes something you practice on a daily. And when the words of your mouth begin to develop your kids as you begin to tell them who they are and who God says they are in the normal stuff. As you're driving down the road. When they get up in the morning. Look at that little champion that just woke up. Mm, devil just got nervous. 
boy, you're up. Because you're great. And there's greatness on the inside of you. God has called you to big things. What happens when we start talking like that? That feels funny. It should. Anything that's right is usually feel comfortable, right? Because you're not used to it. But what would happen? You start speaking those things, start saying those things, and they start believing those things. That's what the whole point of all this mark in the middle is, is to build your faith. Faith to believe that God can do it in you and God can do it in the one he's entrusted you with. Moving. See, and, and, and here's what's real. Like, Josh doesn't go, okay, church, well, here's what we're going to do. The children of Israel, we're going to pack up these stones, and every week we're going to get together, and I'm going to tell you about the stones and how cool what God did. No. He said, you tell your kids every time you walk by. When they ask you, what are these stones, you remind them of what they are. It didn't stop there, and this was something I found, though, in this message that I didn't catch. The, the, I always knew he built a memorial. I didn't know he built two. There's a second one, though, and we're going to pick that up right here. So, so the Israelites did as Joshua commanded. They took the 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan. According to the number of the tribes of the Israelites of the Lord, uh, he had told Joshua, and they carried them over with them to their camp where they put them down. Joshua, though, set up 12 stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan at the Ark of the Covenant, where the Ark, excuse me, a bit in the middle of Jordan at the spot where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant had stood, and they are there to this day. So Joshua builds a second memorial. They take all the stones to the other side, the people who did it. But then Joshua goes into the middle, right where the priests are standing. Remember, the middle, the, the Ark, presence of God. So where God's presence is, Joshua goes there, the middle of the Jordan. And he builds his own memorial out of 12 stones. And it's still standing in that place today. Joshua, why would you build a memorial in the middle of the Jordan River? What's the purpose of this? Give me liberty on this one. I don't know if this is it or not, but here's what I got from this. See, because here's what you need to understand. In the middle, there's going to be seasons. There's going to be seasons where things are going to be really, really difficult. And there's going to be seasons where it may not be as hard. Right. And just like this, this art, this monument he built in the middle of the Jordan, because see, as soon as the priests and we'll read it in a minute, as soon as they come out the Jordan, the flood will come back. It will begin to flood just like it had before. And most likely the flood will be so big, you won't be able to see the stones, but you still know they're there. You still know that under the flood waters, under the crazy rushing water that's there right now, under that sits 12 stones to remind you that God will meet you even in the most difficult of circumstances. So even though I cannot see them right now, I know they're there. And I know they're a reminder that God can do the impossible when things feel like they're going to be impossible. And then there's going to be seasons where the flood water will recede because it doesn't always flood it doesn't always stay at that depth and when it recedes then I can see what God did so even when I can't see it I still know he's there that's for some of you right now that you're going through the hardest season of your life and Joshua would say, remember, he's still there. Remember, even though you can't see it right now, even though it feels like the floodwaters are consuming you and you're about to be washed away, he's still there. It still stands to this day. It's not gone yet. You're not going to be able to see it, but know underneath that water, underneath that madness and that crazy, God is there. You're in the midst of your sickness. God's there. You don't feel him. You don't see him. You don't sense him. But he's there. And one day when the flood waters recede, you will be able to see it with your eyes. But when you cannot see, just know there's still something built right there to remind you that's where God met you in the middle of your situation. He did a miracle there. He can do it again. I love, I love it when God does has these moments. He'll build another one forever, remind you'll always see it. It's on dry ground. But Joshua decided to build something in the middle of the dark circumstance. And there will be moments in your middle, in your season of your middle, where it will feel like you are consumed. Be reminded he's there. It's under the water. You can't see it right now, 
but it's still there. And then there will come moments where the water will recede and you will see it in all of its glory. You can continue to remind yourself it's there. And every time you walk by with your children, when the water's receded, you can point to them stones and say, you see those, son? See those, daughter? There will come seasons in your life where life is going to feel like it's out of control and madness, but God will not leave. He will, stay, he will stay planted in the middle of your situation. Even though you can't feel him, even though you can't sense him, even though you can't see him, he is always there. Some of you, you're hearing me right now and you're saying, how can I speak that when I'm in such a dark place? Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of those things yet to be seen. I don't have to speak what I see, what I feel, or what I sense. I speak what I know, and my knowing is not of this world. It's of another. See, I just love that God says, I'm, 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 gonna, I'm with you, and I won't leave you in these moments. Verse 10, we got to roll. Now the priests who carried the ark remained standing in the middle of the Jordan until everything the Lord had commanded Joshua was done by the people, just as Moses had directed Joshua, the people hurried over. And as soon as all of them had crossed the ark of the Lord and the priests came to the other side while the people watched, then the men of Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh crossed over ready for battle in front of the Israelites as Moses had directed them. About 40,000 armed for battle crossed over before the Lord to the plains of Jericho for war. Then the Lord said to Joshua, command the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Law to come up out the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priest, come up out the Jordan. And the priest came up out of the river carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. No sooner had they set their feet on dry ground than the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and ran at flood stage as before. So that earthquake theory we talked about last week, that an earthquake caused the river to stop flowing one direction, like it's a bunk because as soon as they come out the water, it completely floods again. It will show there's no coincidence that that was God. Then it was the presence of God in the situation. The water stayed back, and as soon as it left, the waters returned. Verse 19 says, And on the tenth day of the first month, the people went up from the Jordan and camped at Gilgal, on eastern border of Jericho, and Joshua set up at Gilgal the 12 stones they had taken out the Jordan. Gilgal was going to be the place of their base of operations. Gilgal was base camp. Gilgal was where it was all going to start from. The conquest of the entire promised land would be happening from Gilgal moving forward. So why did he set it up there? Why did he say build a memorial here? Where you begin, here's where I want you to build this memorial. Here's what I believe. Because there's going to be days coming forward where they're going to march around Jericho one time. And the people in Jericho are going to probably laugh at them and probably say things about them and call them names. And they look kind of dumb. They're just walking around the walls. That's kind of dumb. And there's probably going to be moments in their heart where they're going to feel disheartened. See, they haven't built siege equipment. They haven't built ladders. They built nothing. How is this going to change anything? But here's what happens. Every time they come home, every time they go back to Gilgal, they're going to see some stones standing that will remind them, we walk through dry land through the Jordan. What's Jericho? That was like nature. That's man-made. If God can command nature, what makes them think these walls have a chance? Why does God ask you to mark the milestones in your journey? Because, bro, there's going to be moments where you're going to say, I'm not sure I can keep doing this. I, I don't know it's ever going to change. I don't think it's really ever going to be different. But when you can go back to a milestone of where you saw God do something you never thought you would see done, you see your life in a moment right now that you never could imagine yourself being in, you start to remind yourself, here's what he's doing. He's giving them continual access of encouragement and faith. 
And without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without faith, Jesus said, right, if you, with a little bit of faith, if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. What's God trying to do? He knows us as human beings. We are forgetful people. He wants to remind us of who he is and what he does. Because so often in the midst of our circumstance and situation, we will easily forget. So Joshua at base camp, at the place where we're going to launch the operation, build a memorial. So every time the kids come home, they can be reminded of what I've done before and what I'm going to do now and what I will do for them in the future. So this is the, the, the story. This is what God is doing. Verse 21 through 24, and we'll end it. It says, he said to the Israelites, in the future, when your descendants ask their parents, what do these stones mean? Tell them Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan what he has done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. He did this so that all the people of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might all Always fear the Lord your God. He's teaching them faith, right? What's he saying? Look, what God did for you in the past, he's going to do, he did for you right now. You just watched it. The legacy of faith continues. Grandma and grandpa, they walked through the Jordan. Mommy and daddy, they walked through the Red Sea. You just walked through the Jordan. And if God brought us to this place and now he's doing this in our moment right now, how can we not have faith for what's coming in our future? God says, I'm trying to build something in you. That's the purpose of the middle, remember? It's about development, not destination. I'm building the faith inside of you to not only conquer what's in front of you, but to sustain success, to consistently be reminded. It was God that did that. It is God doing this, and it's God that's going to bring us through that. So fear him consistently and don't forget about him when you step into a place of success. I tell people when I work with in recovery, I believe success is more dangerous than failure. When you're successful, nobody checks you. It's the same if you run a business or something, any, anything you're doing. Success is dangerous. Nobody questions you as much when you're succeeding. When you're failing, they're all up in your business. But when you're successful, everybody thinks it's okay. And it's easy in those moments to forget God and what he has done. It's easy to relax. It's easy to coast. And those are the times you have to be most vigilant because that's when the enemy knows you're most vulnerable. So here's my question. Why do we need to mark our milestones in the middle? Why do we stack stones Why should we mark the milestones of our journeys right now? Here's here's one thought. We don't remember the past great works of God so that we can think, I'm talking to all my seasoned saints right now. The best days of our Christian faith were once behind us. Come on. Well, brother, I remember back in the day when the Holy Ghost would move and we would, whew. me too, me too. I remember that. And I remember what still happened when you went home. I remember hearing some of the loudest people shouting in church and seeing them outside of church. They some of the meanest, nastiest, foul mouth people you ever met in your life. I remember that too. Our best days are not behind us. They're still waiting in front of us. God God didn't bring us from what we come from to go back to what we used to have. That was always my my, my pushback. Like so many of my pastor friends are like, can't wait till we get back to what we once had. Why would God take us out if he wants to bring us back to that? Why would God interrupt our entire world if he wasn't trying to get us to do and move and go somewhere we ain't never been before? And you want to go back? That sounds like Egypt talk to me. Oh, it was so much better back in Egypt when we were in bondage and everything was wonderful. Look, you might have to become innovative and we might have to think different, but here's what's real. Maybe what we're moving into is something that God has been preparing from the foundation of the world. And so he chose you to be a part of it. 
And yet most of us just, oh, I want to go back. I don't want to go back to nothing. You think it was good. It's just familiar. It wasn't good. It's just what you know. It's different. We don't know what God has in store for us next. The other reason why we got to build these stones is we remember them as a point of faith so we can trust God for greater works in the future. I saw him do some great things. 2020, I saw God do miracles in my life. I believe for greater. We succeeded in a season of not should have been successful. Everybody, listen, our church, financially, the best year we ever had was 2020. How? Him? We were bracing for it to get bad. It didn't happen. It was the opposite. It got better, and it got better. And as we watched it get better, we started believing, and we started going, this is kind of crazy. I started a business in 2020. We started a business, my partner and I. <laughs> That's the dumbest plan you could ever have to start a business in 2020. We didn't fold. We kept moving. Money kept coming in. And we weren't even asking sometimes. So if God did that there, well, we survived. That wasn't survival. That was preparation. Because I'm moving forward, right? I'm not going back. I'm not like, well, we just got through that. And now we can breathe. I ain't trying to breathe. I'm trying to take over what God's called us to possess. We've been brought to a place of promise. Now we've got to battle to grab hold of our promise. We remember this as a point of faith so we can continue to believe God's faithfulness. And we mark milestones so we can tell the story to the next generation. You tired of your kids not having faith? Well, my kids, they just don't have faith anymore. Tell the story. Tell them your story of what God did, of how you walked out of a place you never thought you were walking out of, where you stand today. Tell them the story so that way they understand this is who God is, and you don't have to do what I did. You're a man of God, and you can be greater than that. You don't need a test. Listen, I, I remember growing up, sometimes I'm like, well, I, just, I don't have a testimony. I just never did anything bad. So I was dumb and went did bad things so I could have a testimony. That's the dumbest thing ever. You want a real testimony? Somebody who walked with God every day of their life as a little young man began to believe that God is who he said he was. 17, 18 begins to speak the word of God with boldness and conviction. And they begin to go from one level to the next level. They ain't got to work through all the stupid stuff from their past because they follow God their whole life. That's a testimony. Some of you kids watching right now with your parents thinking, oh, I've never been through a bad situation. I guess I'm just one of them boring. There's nothing boring about you. Anybody can do some of the dumb things we did. Very few people can faithfully walk with Jesus like you're doing now. Keep walking. We need heroes like you. To tell a world that you don't have to walk the same way everybody else walks, that you can walk in a different direction. We mark milestones so the world will know God is God. Listen, if you don't know how to tell the story to the people in your home, there's no way you can tell the story to people outside. As you begin to consistently begin to speak, I got people that work for me that believe there is no God, and I'm going to tell you what, faith is growing. <laughs> Every time things look bleak and I'm like, God's going to provide. And they're like, roll their eyes. Next thing you know, check in the mail. I'm like, ha, ah. before it's all said and done, you will be testifying, right? <laughs> we mark so that our world will know that God is God. We need to mark our milestones. Can I get some background music? So here's my question. For everyone to think about right now, what are your milestones you need to mark in your middle? For real, introspection right now. Stop, stop, stop thinking about the message, thinking about what you're about to eat, thinking about you got to pee or you got to have a cigarette. Quit. All I want you to think about right now is what are the milestones you need to mark in your middle? What are the milestones that need to be marked right now? When's the last time you stopped to think about where God has brought you from? Who you used to be? where you were a year from a, a year ago, where you were two years ago, where you were 10 years ago. 
When's the last time you took a moment just to look back? I'm not saying looking back like you're going back. I'm saying looking back to remind yourself. We wandered a desert for 40 years, believing there would be one day a promise, listening to our parents talking about it and watching them die and never seeing the promise. And now we are standing in the place that they dreamed of. We're standing in promise. Where are you at this morning? Think to yourself right now, how has God provided for you? Even in the midst of maybe the darkest season of your life, would have been those moments where he spoke to you and the quiet that you felt him touch your heart. The moments that he sent a specific word at a specific moment when you felt like life was about to consume you And that word got to you just in time, and it brought life back to you. He brought the right person into your life to help you continue your journey. Where are the moments where God provided? Those are the milestones that need to be marked. How, in some of the darkest nights, has his presence been so unmistakable? Where it looked bleak, you were doing it all right, and then it all seemed to go so wrong. And you were left with all kinds of questions, but yet in the midst of all of the uncertainty and all of the sadness, you felt his presence more real than you ever have before. You got to learn to mark your milestones. You got to learn to begin to build these markers. How do we mark milestones? I'm going to throw out some suggestions. Number one, journal. I know, guys, you're like, oh, I got that little book with a little heart lock, put it under my pillow, and just write it somewhere. Write the story down so when somebody asks you sometime, you can remind them, this is what God did. I remember when the check came in the mail. I remember when I thought it was over. I remember. I remember staring at that bottle and hating every moment of it and feeling like I was never, it was never going to change. Look what God did. Write it down. If you don't want to write it down, then talk about it to someone. Tell your spouse, tell a friend, tell somebody close to you, tell your counselor. Whatever you got to tell, tell me, email me. I got to tell you the story of what God did. I got to celebrate this. I got to celebrate it with somebody. If I got nobody else, I'm going to find me a friend to celebrate with. But I got to tell you the story. Because here's what happens. Out of the abundance of my heart, my mouth speaks. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I begin to speak God's word in my story. And I speak of what he's done for me. I start to build my faith. I start to believe i got to tell you the story. So tell the story to somebody. And you can even take it farther than that. Just write it in your Bible. January 31st, 2021, I was in a service. And my heart felt like it was about to melt. And then some crazy preacher who talks way too much started to preach. And I felt like God met me in that moment. And all of a sudden, there was courage to begin to build up on the inside of me. Write it in your Bible. Make sure it's somewhere. Or maybe, maybe buy something and put it in your house as a memento, something that you can walk by every day to remind you that's what God did. Kids, you see that thing on the mantle up there? That's a forever reminder of the moment that God broke that hold on my life. I'm no longer under that bondage anymore. That's why I bought that. That piece of chain sitting on the mantle represents the chains that used to hold me that don't hold me anymore. And in Jesus' name, they'll never hold you either. 
Tell the story, man. Do something. Write something. Throw a party. Put it on the calendar. Mark a special meal. Mark the milestones because there'll be moments you're going to want to quit. You're going to want to give up. You're going to want to go back. It will get harder, but it's those moments that you can be reminded he's there. He's not leaving me. He's not forsaking me like the pillars under the water. Even though I can't see them, I know they're there. I know they will stand strong, and I know that he has met me in those moments before, and he'll meet me again. Even though he chooses not to part the waters right now in my situation, he's still God, and he's still good. Again, the devil doesn't know everything. He can't read your mind. He's throwing bombs at you left and right, and that's how you respond, and he's confused. I'm throwing everything I got at him, and I can't shake him. What's up? That's what I love about worship. That's what worship is, y'all. When you begin to worship God in the midst of your circumstances, the devil's going, what must I do to mess with these people? I learned to worship in the darkest of nights. I can worship any night, right? And so stand to your feet. I want to pray for you, and I'll let you go, but we may sing a song. Because you might need to. Because right now, it's all coming out crazy for you and you're struggling. But you begin to worship. You begin to build a milestone. You begin to say, though I feel this in my heart, I choose to sing this with my mouth. And my words and what I say to God are more real to me right now than what I feel. Heavenly Father, I pray for these people right now that are in the midst of their middle and they're struggling. God, I pray today as we're talking about marking milestones, I pray throughout this whole week they'll be looking for the milestones. They'll be looking for the moments. I pray for little kids to begin to tell their mom and daddy, that's a milestone right there. Look what God just did. He brought us snow today. We got to all stay home and play in the snow. Milestone. Daddy, you were talking about being too busy, and now you can't even do what you were going to do anyway because it's all bad outside, so we get to go out and play together. Milestone. Man, God, I pray for that. I pray that we learn to mark our milestones because this is what we need, God. The world, yeah, is crazy, but but <laughs> we need to be a people of great faith, and great faith is built in the middle, and it's built as we continue to remind ourselves of the milestones that God keeps doing over and over and again. And God, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that the enemy's distraction, the enemy's frustration, the enemy's confusion, the way the enemy wants to creep in and cause us to stop believing and stop seeing what God is doing I pray we silence the voice of our adversary right now. And all we can hear is what you're saying. I'm with you in the middle. It's in the middle. I'm with you. I'm not going to leave you. It's dark right now, but I'm there. There's light that I'm bringing into your situation. Heavenly Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you begin to raise up faith on the inside of each person listening to me right now. God, I pray as we begin to close this down, we sing this last song, whatever it's going to be, I pray that our words would be our truth. Our words would be what we say. We're speaking. God, we feel in the depths of our soul. We're not speaking what we see. I don't see it right now. The water has consumed the memorial that I once saw. My heart feels flooded with grief and sadness and sorrow. But I sing because I know underneath the sadness and the sorrow, there is a monument of where God has met me continually in my middle. And though I cannot see it, I will believe it with all that's within me. Father, I pray for each person as they go back into their middle in the next moments that you would be with them consistently. You won't leave them nor forsake them. Most importantly, let them feel your presence so real like they haven't felt in a long time. Jesus, we love you so much and we're so thankful that you never leave us or forsake us. Now I ask God as we get ready to step out back into what you've called us to, we go with your strength, your boldness, and the faith to know you're there, even in the midst of my middle. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.